Hello, puppies and kittens. Once again, we're doing another episode of Matter of Fact Science. I'm very pleased to uh, have this guest today. I and mean, one of the heroes I've admired for a while now. Uh, this is uh, Professor Kenneth Miller, PhD. Uh, I call him a hero because when I got into activism, the reason that I did was because I was in an online community, you know, back in the days of, uh, of uh, Usenet, talking and talk.origins, and, and the Christians there were telling me uh, that this, this was a specific group. These were Reconstructionists that I was talking to at that time, and they were telling me how all of their, co their congregation voted exactly as the minister told them to vote because all of the ministers were on the phone with each other to get everybody in the state, all of the congregations to vote to get you know, specific evangelical judges and senators and school board members and, and everything just so that they could have this culture war that I wasn't even aware was going on. And so they were going to take over the whole country by replacing all of the politicians, the judges and everything. And then shortly after that was uh, accidentally released the, or uh, it was the, actually accidentally leaked the, the wedge strategy from the discovery Institute, which talked about how, they were going to get all these churches together so that they can violate the Johnson Amendment and and you know replace all of the, the the judges and so forth with evangelicals to eventually get to a court case where you can then override uh, change sex education, change the history so that it becomes you know American exceptionalism and all of that, and start um, and undermine science. And that was one of the first steps that they wanted to do was to undermine science. And they expect everything went according to their plan. They had set out like a five-year plan. Sure enough, we get from Y2K, we get to 2005, and then there is a court case that ended up being Kitzmiller versus Dover, where they had a conservative Christian Republican Bush-appointed judge, and now that we're taking intelligent design to court. And I, I was, I shuddered at how that was all taking place. And I'd been active for years already on this activated by this, by, by hearing about this insidious plan. Now, remember, the Reconstructionists I was talking to were saying that they wanted to overturn our, our representative uh, democracy, our republic, and replace it with a theocracy that would enforce Levitical law. And if you think Sharia is bad, try to imagine, just, just read through Leviticus and imagine our country uh, uh, supporting and endorsing that. So anyway, what ended up happening was not the way things were looking at all. And so this is why I call uh, Ken, Ken Miller a, a hero because of his part of this and some and some of the other people involved as well. So Kenneth Miller, will you please take it away from here? Well, thank you. Um, I, I've admired you from afar for a long time. So it's a delight to be on your program. Uh, thank you for calling me a hero and referring to the Kitz Miller trial. Uh, but I have to tell you something about that trial, and I'm sure we'll get to the details. Um, when I came back from two days of testimony and came back to my university, uh, I had a lot of people pat me on the back saying, boy, it was really courageous of you to get on the stand and endure eight or nine hours of cross-examination, all this other sort of stuff. And I had to correct them. And I had to say, look, man, I'm a tenured professor at Ivy League University. You know, I'm, I'm you know, in the rocking chair in terms of uh, scientifically and reputation-wise and so forth. The real heroes of that case were 11 parents who lived in Dover, Pennsylvania, and still do, because they were the ones who created the case. They were the ones who endured the slings and arrows uh, of their neighbors who occasionally had threats made against them. Tammy Kitzmiller at one point went through a mailbox and there was a bullet wrapped inside a note the message of that was clear. Uh, these are the people who are the real heroes. These are the people who had the courage to testify in court. Um, and they're the people who really won the case. So, um, yeah, there were a lot of other people. But the first people I put there are the 11 parents from Dover. One of the big surprises, one of the, one of the heroes in that case that was wholly unexpected was the judge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want to hear about him? So anyway... <laughs> the um, the uh, as 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 the case moved towards trial, the uh, the advocates for the school board and and just for the benefit of your listeners who don't know the case, what happened in Dover is in a school board election, and I believe it was in two thousand five, quite quietly and unnoticed at first, 
uh, a group of uh, evangelical churches promoted their own candidates, and they basically uh, produced a majority on the nine-member Board of Education. Then during the summer of 2004, um, they got together with the science teachers at Dover Area High School and told them two things. One is um, that uh, they had enough money for them to replace the old worn out biology textbooks they were using. And they wanted them to take some time to prepare a curriculum on something called intelligent design. Now it turns out the biology teachers, and you gotta realize how small Dover is, there were only three of them, um, supported by their science department chair, uh, a wonderful woman named Bertha Spar. Um, um, first of all, they looked at the books around and they picked uh, uh, the book that I co-authored with Joe Levine. It's uh, published by, at the time by Pearson, simply called Biology by Miller and Levine. Um, but they also got together and decided, no, this intelligent design stuff is nonsense. We're not going to teach it. And their jobs were very, very much at risk. Uh, and what happened after that? was the school board got a look at our textbook and there's this wonderful video clip that was carried on a local news channel where the chairman of their uh, curriculum committee, a guy named William Buckingham, uh, the, the, after a school board meeting was interviewed by a reporter and he said the book that was recommended for biology was loaded with Darwinism cover to cover. And you know how authors sometimes like to put endorsement quotes on the back of their books? As soon as Joe Levine and I heard that, we thought we ought to, we ought to put that on the back of our book uh, because an awful lot of biology teachers would like it. So the school board, frustrated that they couldn't bully the teacher, did two things. One is they bought two classroom sets of a book called Of Pandas and People which is an intelligent design textbook. And I'll put the word textbook in air quotes. And um, they asked, they drafted a four paragraph lesson, if you will, on intelligent design. Now imagine the horror of a school board writing a science lesson verbatim, but nonetheless, they did that. And they went to the teachers and they say, will you at least read this to the students and tell them about these books, which are now in the library? And once again, these teachers, at the risk of losing their jobs, they refused. So the school board was reduced to sending the assistant superintendent to Dover High School one day to teach all of the biology classes uh, and read the intelligent design statement, while the biology teachers metaphorically and physically stood in the hallway outside the classroom. And a week after that, 11 parents, uh, very agitated, uh, about what was being fed to their kids in high school got together. They were supported by the ACLU and they filed a First Amendment lawsuit in uh, federal district court in Harrisburg. Uh, now, the attorney, the school board then had to get attorneys, of course, um, and they were, uh, they were given an offer by the Thomas More Legal Foundation, uh, a foundation which describes itself as the sword and shield for the people of Christ in legal manners. Uh, and the Thomas More Foundation said, don't worry about it. We will take care of it. We'll cover all your legal costs. So it turns out that wasn't quite right. But they were actually quite thrilled at the judge. His name is John Jones III. He is a lifelong Republican, uh, had been a, a protege of Governor Tom Ridge, uh, the Republican governor of Pennsylvania, who, by the way, was George Bush's first secretary of Homeland Security. And he had a reputation, he still does, as a strictly conservative jurist. So they figured we got our guy. Um, I have to tell you, however, um, Judge Jones almost single-handedly restored my faith in the federal judiciary. And it wasn't just because he found for our side in the case, the plaintiffs. It was because of the really even-handed fair way he conducted that trial. So, for example, I wasn't in on the, the conferences with the lawyers. But our lawyers told me that several weeks before the trial, he got the law, lawyers for Thomas More, and then the lawyers representing those 11 parents together and said, look, either side could employ all sorts of, of slick legal gimmicks, gimmicks to delay this, to tie things up. Let's not do that. 
And let's have both sides agree they're just going to prevent the present the case, bring in their witnesses, and argue the facts of the case. And with Judge Jones presiding, they did exactly that. And I'll tell you one other thing. Um, I was the first witness on the stand on a Monday morning, September 2005. And I was on the stand all morning. And uh, when it came time to break for lunch, um, we all went out and our attorneys and the parents who were plaintiffs that I was working with, we all went out to lunch and they all wanted to know what the judge was doing. Because the entire time during my testimony, he had an open laptop. And rather than looking at me, he was looking at the laptop and doing something. So they wanted to know, you know, what's the guy doing? Is he is he looking at porn? Is he updating his Facebook status? Is he making travel plans? Well, it's out. I did a glimpse of what's happening. Godfrey, of course, was transcribing a testimony. And he had his laptop set up. So the typewritten testimony would flow past his screen. And what he was doing was highlighting a sentence here, a paragraph there. In other words, he was in effect taking notes during my testimony by highlighting passages he wanted to come back to. He was working really hard. Um, and I think by the end of the trial, um, we all gained enormous respect, respect for Judge Jones. The other thing about Judge Jones is he had a sense of humor which is not something I would always expect in a judge. Um, and the first part of my testimony in that first morning of the trial was a bit like a lecture because uh, our attorneys would ask me a question. I would then refer to a slide, PowerPoint slide, on a great big screen that everybody in the court could see. So it was very much like a lecture, even though I had to, uh, not lecture, but I had to answer direct questions from Vic Wolchek, the great ACLU attorney. So at the end of this, when the judge said, well, it's getting about lunchtime, and he said, I'm tempted to say uh, court dismissed, but instead I'm going to say class adjourned. Uh, and that really brought down the house. It was a nice light moment. And he he had a lot of those. When am I going to learn not to do that? <laughs> I have to. I have to mute my mic because I'm always afraid that the dogs are going to go off. And so I, you I, must, I, Aaron. You must not be spending enough time on Zoom, or that would be reflexive. Un, unmuting yourself. <laughs> I suppose so. Uh, one, one of the issues about uh, the, the the judge uh, that was a surprise was I know that it was a surprise to the to the other side of this case too because they had written two responses. It was. I was aware that they had written two responses, depending on how the judge was going to rule, so that they have something ready to post immediately. And if I remember correctly, one of them accused him of being an activist. And, and am I right? Is that the right case where the where the judge predicted that they would call him an activist in his own ruling? Yes. In fact, he gave a statement, I believe, to the press, um, in which he said, "Some people will no doubt say I'm an activist judge." Um, but, but, but of course he wasn't an activist judge. He was interpreting, uh, the first amendment as it is written as any true conservative jurist actually, actually would. And, you know, when the case was over, um, I wasn't really sure if it was proper to talk to a judge after you had been in a case, but maybe a year, year and a half after the case was decided, I was at a conference, and I think it was uh, either the National Association of Biology Teachers or the National Science Teachers Association. There was a panel discussion about the trial and about issues concerning the teaching of evolution. The judge was on the panel, um, and I was on the panel as well. So we had to chat nicely, um, and then we went out, to, you know, for a beer afterwards. Um, and uh, you know, he asked me what uh, my background was, and I told him. And he said, "What are your politics?" And I said, "Well, you know." The, I always like to tell people in the real world, I'm a left-wing liberal Democrat. Um, as soon as I step foot on my college campus, though, I become a conservative. And I do that without actually changing any of my views, which he thought was amusing. And he said, you know, were you ever interested in politics per se? And I said, yeah. When I was a teenager, I was enamored, that's probably the right word, of Barry Goldwater. Um, and the judge... Uh, very candidly turned to me, the judge is a bit younger than I am. So, you know, he was a grade school kid. I was a teenager when Goldwater ran for president. And he said, 
What do you think Barry Goldwater would think of today's Republican Party? And I said, candidly, I think he'd be horrified. And the judge nodded his head vigorously and said, you bet. Well, he predicted it, didn't he? Yeah, indeed. Yeah. So it, I was uh, I was very pleased when we had had this uh, conversation when we when we you and I met uh, last week we had another another chat right. with, uh, helping with a, with a video that'll be coming out with shortly uh, and I was uh, I was impressed with how personable you are how you know how generous you were you were in the conversation and everything and so I want to thank you for that uh, very sure. easy to get along, very easy to get along with you yeah well right back at you. No, thank you. Uh, now, I'm I'm terrified of when somebody asks what your politics are because uh, th we are in such a divisive time right now that uh, that my family, for example, they were able to get over my not having any belief in God, but the, but when I didn't worship the orange God, that created a problem, and so I've actually lost friends and family over this, and I'm I'm really hoping for this divisive period to be over with. I, uh, I am too. Yeah. So that's why I'm happy to hear today about, you know, Republicans I admire, conservatives I admire, Christians <laughs> I admire, because that'll probably surprise some people, but that's possible to do that. Um, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, what do you think about the chances? Uh, first, the, I guess the first question I have is, can you put in, uh, into perspective for the audience uh, what what uh this decision uh dover versus kill mill mister uh yeah, sorry if i mispronounced that um, okay. uh what that uh what that changed about science education and uh, the teaching of intelligent design in classrooms sure that and that's a great question and that's really the heart of the matter um what had happened of course is is the uh, school board had implemented this policy to teach intelligent design and the contention of the plaintiffs, these are 11 parents, and they were backed up by a, a, a lawyer from the ACLU named Vic Wolchak and two absolutely superstar uh, private attorneys from a, uh, from, from a corporate law firm who took the case pro bono and were um, uh, remarkably effective, Steve Harvey and Eric Rothschild. Um, the contention of the plaintiffs was twofold. One is... This intelligent design doctrine um, is, is faulty science, so it certainly doesn't belong in the science classroom. Although that would not have been a legally persuasive argument. Um, you can't sue your school board on the ground that they're teaching stupid stuff or things that just ain't so. Um, the question was why? What was the motivation for the school board doing this? And the key contention was that intelligent design is a thinly veiled attempt to promote creationism and to promote a, not just religion, but a particular religious view in the classroom to the exclusion of all other religious understandings. In effect, it amounted to the establishment of a religion by a government agency. So that, that really was the contention. Now I have to you know, basically take my hat off to the person who I think was the star of the trial. And I always like to tell people um, who were, are kind to me about the work that I did for the trial, that if I had been run over by a truck two weeks before the trial, there's probably 100 or 200 other biologists in the country who could have stepped right into my shoes and could have done exactly the job that I did. But there was one of the expert witnesses, we had five, one of the expert witnesses who was irreplaceable, and that is Barbara Forrest, who's a professor of philosophy at Southeastern uh, Louisiana University. And the reason for this is Barbara had made an academic study of the intelligent design movement. And what she was able to show to the judge was that after an influential Supreme Court case, the advocates of creationism realized that they could never get creation into the public schools by calling it that. So they literally brainstormed for a new thing to call it. Um, and that new thing was intelligent design. 
and you would then replace God or the creator with the designer. And you would imply that there's no, no implication that the designer is a, a, a supreme being, that the designer is spiritual. Um, Michael B. at one point said the designer could be uh, an interstellar alien and we could be his honors thesis project uh, in terms of creating life on Earth and that sort of stuff. So what Barbara did was to show the subterfuge involved in taking the basic tenets of creationism, trying to scrub the references to religion out of them and call it intelligent design. And uh, she was aided in this by a book, a preliminary version of the book Pandas and People, the very book that the Dover School Board had placed in front of their students. In the preliminary version of that book, it talked about the creator and creation and creationist and proponents of creation. After the Supreme Court decision in question, which is called Edwards versus Aguilard, what the editors or the writers clearly did was to do a Microsoft Word find and replace and replaced each occurrence of the word creator with the word designer and each occurrence of the word uh, creation with design. Uh, and they did it quite well, except they made one little mistake. Um, and there was a, uh, uh, a little, you, you might say, word processing fossil in the middle of the draft. And we all, we've joked about that for years. And basically they had taken the word creationists and they wanted to take creationists with design proponents, but they did something funky with the find and replace. So in that text, there was the word C design proponentists. So you still had the C from creation. You still had the ists on the other end, and then you had design proponents in the middle. And it was a perfect example of this. Um, what this showed, and this is why Barbara was irreplaceable. Uh, what this showed was that there was deception involved here. And one of the things the judge clearly reacted against was any attempt to mislead the court. And he saw that um, basically as an attempt to hide true, hide true motivations. Now, when the case was decided and trial went on for seven weeks, um, the judge came down with a, just a ringing and beautifully written and very clear opinion. Um, what this did was it sort of put the lie to a position that the Discovery Institute, which to this day still pushes intelligent design, the Discovery Institute had been arguing literally for years that if intelligent design ever came up for a court test, because it's not religious, they say, it would pass that test. And what the Kitzmiller case showed very influentially was, nope, it wouldn't pass that test. Now, at the very time that the trial was going on, there was considerable controversy right next door in the state of Ohio um, regarding how to revise their own science education standards and whether or not to include intelligent design. And it's fair to say that when the Kitzmiller case came down, all of a sudden, even the proponents of these ideas in the state of Ohio realized, oh, if we do this, we're going to be taken to court and we're going to lose. And that, that realization has really spread around the country. There are still plenty of people who advocate intelligent design. But since the Kitzmiller case, no state board of education, no school board has ever taken seriously the idea of putting intelligent design in the classroom. And that, therefore, is a, a really substantial victory. Um, the other thing people have asked me about is, well, will the Supreme Court ever get the case? And this is a little interesting because um, what would have happened is the advocates for the uh, Thomas More Foundation for the school board, they were prepared to lose and they were prepared to appeal. But remember, the lawyer can't appeal. It has to be the defendant, the school board, who appeals. When the trial was still going on, there was a school board election in Dover. And what happened is the good people of Dover voted out the entire Intelligent Design School Board, and they seated a couple of members on the board who actually were among the plaintiffs. So they had won the case. And the school board told Thomas More Legal Foundation, thanks for nothing, we're not appealing. 
Therefore, this decision never went any farther up than district court, but it was a persuasive precedent that really has held sway throughout the country. So the, the case, in retrospect, was enormously important in safeguarding the integrity of science education. Uh, thank you. Uh, we've met Bar Barbara Forrester before at a conference, I believe. Uh, I didn't know she was so pivotal, and thank you for that story. And you. Oh, and let me tell you what. Let me tell you how pivotal she was, if you don't mind. No problem. Um, we had five expert witnesses on our case. Now, let's suppose you're the attor opposing attorney, and the other side says we got these five expert witnesses, and you think, no, 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 that one's not really an expert, or I don't like what that one's going to say, so we're going to challenge them. Well, there is a process to challenge an expert witness. You do this before the trial. It's called a Dauber hearing, D-A-U-B-E-R. It's named after the case in which this procedure was developed, okay? Of all of our five expert witnesses, the Thomas More lawyers only challenged one, and that was Barbara. They didn't challenge me. They didn't challenge John Haught, a theologian. They didn't challenge the wonderful Kevin Padian, who's a paleontologist from Cal Berkeley. They realized that if Barbara Forrest came to the stand, they were toast. And they did everything they possibly could to challenge her. Um, and I have to tell you one other thing that is, for me, one of the delightful moments of the trial. And that is at one point during her cross-examination in the trial itself, the attorney for the school board said, you're a card-carrying member of the ACLU, aren't you? At which point Barbara reached into her purse and brought out her ACLU card. It was just a delightful moment. At least, at least uh, they didn't ask if she was a card-carrying member of the Satanic Temple or something. That would have no, been I, I don't think she had a card for that. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. the, the, you anticipated my question, but this leads to another question. You kind of answered it already. They can't, uh, so they can't um, appeal your particular case. Right, and because, because they, the only people who would appeal are the current school board and the school board was happy with it. The, after the election, that school board was happy with the decision. So uh, you... the way Arne, um, the, someone else is anticipating this question in the chat also, and I'm kind of skipping okay. the other questions. And they, they said, uh, Drew at Lover One says, uh, can you ask Dr. Miller, what he thinks would ha have happened if Kitz, Mil Kitz Miller versus Dover were presented to today's Supreme Court? But I would say you kind of entered that in, in that you can't appeal this particular case. But of course, there Project Blitz, people are trying to get creationism in classrooms still. So someone, if they get it rejected and they get it all the way up the pipeline, could it could go to this today's Supreme Court. So what do you sure. think about their chances now? Well, um, the uh, you know, I'm not thrilled with the composition of the Supreme Court today. Um, and I think a lot of people feel the same way. Um, but there's a couple things here. One is, as, as I'm sure you know, the Supreme Court turns away far more cases than it actually hears. And there are times when the court makes what I would regard as a judicious decision not to mess with lower court rulings. Now, you know, if you want to extend the hypothetical, uh, we now have nine justices on the Supreme Court. Um, now, I'm a Roman Catholic myself, but there's a, a large number of Catholics on the Supreme Court. And I do know the strategy that I would use if uh, that I would advise any attorney who had to defend the Kitzmiller decision, and that is to emphasize the number of times in which the Catholic Church has officially embraced the idea of evolution, from Pius XII to John Paul II to the current Pope. Um, and I don't know if that would be persuasive to my Catholic brothers and sisters on the court or not, but I think it could be effective in diffusing the argument that evolution amounts to an anti-religious doctrine. I, I do worry however, 
uh, during the the older decision that I referenced, which was the last Supreme Court decision on this, which is Edwards versus Aguilard, um, uh, Antonin Scalia um, wrote a dissenting opinion. I believe it was a seven to two decision. Scalia was one of the two. And that was the moment, up to that point, I had thought Scalia, even though I disagreed with him in lots of ways, I thought he was a really smart guy. After I read his dissent in Edwards versus Aguilard, I decided, nah, he's been taken in by these charlatans, which is unfortunate. Um, I, so, so, you know, I would uh, not be as optimistic that the current Supreme Court would back up Kitz Miller um, as I might have been a few years ago. The, so, the new justice right. also has uh, maybe not as much respect for precedent because she terms herself an originalist. Well, so, what I, you know, it, it, during the 200th anniversary of the United States, um, uh, Alistair Cook, a British journalist, did this wonderful series on PBS about America. Uh, and I remember one of his shows was about the Supreme Court. And, you know, th there's no similar institution in any country in Europe. There are a lot of countries that have a highest court, but they don't have the power that our Supreme Court does. And one of the things he says is the Supreme Court truly is supreme over the other branches of government when it makes a ruling. And then he emphasized, and it is not bound by precedent. And when you look at some earlier Supreme Court decisions, uh, the Dred Scott decision, Plessy versus Ferguson, a host host of others. I'm kind of glad it's not bound by precedent. I have a question on that. Given the Scopes trial, you know where it was, it's deemed uh, illegal to teach evolution, and right. and then we have Edwards versus Aguilar, where you can't you can't uh, teach something that is ex exclusively promoting a religious position. Where you can't you can't, they had to decriminalize evolution in effect, and then sure. in another case. And I'm I'm not sure what the title of that one was. It was another case where, uh, where you couldn't. And was it? It was Edwards, Edwards versus Aguilar, where you can no longer teach creationism. And then there was a prior case where they made it legal to teach evolution. But they're going to keep coming at this, and and this leads to, to two questions. I mean, one, ever since 2005, I have had to tell countless creationists that all their arguments for intelligent design were disproved by yourself. And, and a lot of people don't realize that you didn't just disprove the ones that were in the court case. You, you took on uh, Behe's other claims prior to going to that trial. And, and I'd like to hear more about that since that, that didn't get a lot of publicity. So yeah. mark the, that the, down the, talk about in a moment. Yes? Yeah. If I may, the prior case that, whose name probably escapes you um, was Epperson versus Arkansas. Um, and it, this is, um, for me, this is one of my favorite stories to tell. And that is... Um, Susan Epperson, who is a 25-year-old first-year biology teacher at, Little, at, at Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. And that's a high school that has produced more than its share of American history. And if any of your, your viewers are not sure, what do I mean, Central High School, Little Rock, Little Rock tell them to Google it, um, and they'll discover a lot of things happened at that high school in the 50s. But she, was, uh, uh, she presented lesson plans to her department chair that included a week and a half on, on evolution. And her department chair called her in and said, you know, uh, 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 Susan, I don't want to lose you. You're a really good teacher. But teaching evolution in the state of Arkansas is against the law. So you can't do this. So please take that out of your lesson plans. I don't mind, but somebody else might see it. So imagine the chutzpah. This 25-year-old teacher sues the state of Arkansas, arguing that this law is unconstitutional. She's not aided by the ACLU, but by the teachers' union. She wins the case. The state appeals it to the state Supreme Court. The attorney general of Arkansas himself shows up in court to argue the case. The Supreme Court reverses the lower court, reinstates the law, she takes it to the United States Supreme Court, Edwards versus Arkansas in 1965, and she wins in the Supreme Court. Um, up to that point, there were six states, including Tennessee, where it was called the Butler Act, under which John Scopes had been tried. There were six states that had laws on the book against teaching evolution. Um, it was Epperson versus Arkansas that tossed out all of those laws. 
So uh, I always thought Susan really deserves a very special place in American history. And I've been honored. This happened after the Kitzmiller trial to become her friend and get to know her pretty well. Now, I know I went off on a tirade, but what was the question? <laughs> yeah, I was leading up to, given these prior cases, yeah. and, and the fact that the creationists do not take being proven wrong yeah. to, to, as an answer. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, they're, they're, they're constantly right. going on. Shut up, dog. He, he's asleep and barking. I swear to you. Anyway. <laughs> I, they, I've had to argue with all these creationists who insisted, you know, that, that we can't counter intelligent design. And so I just show them the court's ruling on that. Yeah. And, and on one of those issues, I have to, it's a little harder to find because it's not part of that same ruling. I have to go to other sources for it, but you took on another of the arguments for, for uh, irreducible complexity that Behe had promoted and that Behe apparently knew better than to bring you to the court because you had already publicly disproved it. Can you tell us about that one? Well, th th there were quite a few, and uh, uh, Michael had published a book called Darwin's Black Box, and he argued that there was a property that complex living systems have called an called irreducible complexity, um, and there are lots of things, biochemical pathways, structures like the flagellum, the proteins of the immune system that are composed of multiple parts. And it's true that if you take any of those parts away, the system stops working. So Behe had argued that evolution couldn't produce such a system because evolution works gradually. And the only way these systems could have come about is if they were created, designed, where a designer put all the parts together at once and vroom, the thing started working. And his favorite example was this beautiful, a uh, hydrogen ion driven rotary motor called the bacterial flagellum that exists in many bacteria. But he also raised the issue of the immune system, of vesicle, tar uh, vesicle targeting within the cell, um, and the blood clotting system, which involves, depending on the organism, 15 or 16 different proteins to regulate the clotting of blood. And he said all of these systems are irreducibly complex. That means they could not have evolved, and that means they had to be designed by a designer. And what I did in a review of his book, in a couple of uh, articles, and also in court, was to take his systems of his choosing and show that his argument, um, that you had to have all the parts together before you had any selective advantage that evolution could work on, I showed that that argument was wrong. Because it turns out, for example, uh, and I'll just mention one because I know we have limited time, the bacterial flagellum has about 40 proteins. And remember, his argument is take even one away and the system stops working. Well, it turns out there are quite a few bacteria that don't have flagella, but they do have a 10 protein structure called a type three secretory system that basically is used to uh, basically transport proteins across the cell membrane. Those 10 proteins in that secretory system are exactly homologous to the proteins in the base of the bacterial flagellum. So what that showed is I could take away one part, two parts, I could take away 30 parts from the flagellum and I still have a functional unit which can be favored by natural selection. And I was able to show the same thing with vesicle targeting and in fact, the same thing with respect to the blood clotting system. Um, one of my favorite parts of the trial and darn it, I was not in the courtroom to see this, is when Michael was cross-examined by Eric Rothschild, and uh, uh, I and a wonderful guy named Nick Matsky had gotten together uh, basically a cross-examination script for Eric, our attorney, to use to ask Behe about the vertebrate immune system, the way in which we make antibodies to viruses, bacteria, and so forth. And it turns out I had found seven scientific papers, which I gave copies of, on how the vertebrate, the vertebrate uh, uh, immune system evolved. One of them was actually called the Darwinian evolution of the vertebrate immune system. And remember, B, he had said it could not have evolved because it's irreducibly complex. Well, Nick took my seven and he found about 35 more and several books and monographs. So what happened during the cross-examination is Eric led Michael to say, that's right, 
The system has multi parts. It's irreducibly complex. Therefore, it had to be designed. And then uh, uh, Eric, the attorney, uh, took out a piece of paper and said, this is a, a paper called the Darwinian Evolution of the Immune System. Doesn't that show you're wrong? And B, he said, no, no, no. I, I dismissed that for this reason. Then he took out another paper. Then he took out another one. Then he took out another one. Yeah, then, he took out a, then he took out a monograph. And <laughs> gradually, this piled up in front of Dr. Behe on the witness stand. Now, to appreciate how comic this moment is, you have to realize that Dr. Behe is not very tall. And neither, in fact, was Eric Rothschild. And Eric kept moving back and forth behind the pile of evidence. And Behe had to constantly do this to maintain eye contact with him. But he dismissed in front of the judge this enormous pile of evidence for the evolution of the immune system. And at one point, he actually turned to the judge and said, Your Honor, can I push this to one side? And the, the, the graphic metaphor of be pushing the evidence away is something that stuck with everybody in the courtroom. Now, wasn't this the case? I was just about to ask you about it before I could see the punchline coming. In. <laughs> I'm trying to intercede. Wasn't this where he said that science would never ever produce an explanation? Yes. The, the argument is there can be no scientific explanation. And one of the people, um, and he's a scientific hero for me, that I relied on in educating myself about some of these systems is Russell Doolittle, who's a biochemist, now retired at the University of California at San Diego, and has spent the, the latter part of his scientific career, more than 25 years, working out how the vertebrate blood clotting system evolved. And he's actually even published a book, a monograph, on the evolution of the blood clotting system. And step by step, Doolittle has investigated the proteins. He's found primitive chordates, the ancestors of vertebrates, which have bits and pieces of the blood clotting system that are functional in different contexts lying around. And this is how evolution builds complex systems. It takes spare parts from other systems, combines them, finds new function for them, and blood clotting is exactly such a system. So literally every system that B had cited in his book, Darwin's Black Box, has been shown to be capable of being produced by evolution. I, I, slightly changing the, the, the subject here. I mean, I've often had to distinguish when I wrote my, my story and, and my, my book and also my video series on the foundational falsehoods of creationism, the very first of those foundational falsehoods is the false dichotomy that one either has to be a biblical literalist creationist yeah. or you have to be an atheist evolutionist and that it's just this it's entirely binary you have to be all the way on this side or all the way on this side and so uh, when i mentioned to i mentioned to a christian a day or two ago that 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 i, I was going to have you uh, on the show today and he called you a satanist for not being so far on that side. That's got to come as a big surprise to my parish priest and the Catholic chaplain that's met my school. Well, yeah, I'm sure you get it all the time. I mean, you're, you're a false Christian because you don't believe in, in you know, the, the biblical yeah. creation thing. And you're a false Christian probably because, you, you're, because you're Catholic. You know, I, I hear that a lot too. But, but my, my, my question, and, and of course, they're false Christians too. I had to tell this guy there's no such thing as a true Christian. Matter of fact, I had to tell a Protestant and a Catholic in the same day yesterday I had to tell both of them that neither one of them were true Christians because they were they were both saying that the other one wasn't. Oh my! Yeah. yeah if, if 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 Christianity in its two thousand year history has been distinguished by anything, it's by its tendency to break into factions, um, and of course we still see that today. Um, the the uh, I have to say when I. Uh, my very first year at Brown University, where I still teach, was uh, 1981. And I was challenged by a group of students in an introductory biology class I taught to debate a famous scientific creationist named Henry Morris, the founder of the so-called Institute for Creation Research. And foolishly, I agreed. Um, but I managed to get these students to provide me with audio tapes 
uh, and of his previous debates, his books, and so forth. And as I read through them, there were two things that infuriated me. The first thing is the number of scientific falsehoods in their arguments. And I can go into those and I could talk about those for hours. But those are infuriating to me as a scientist. But the real motivation was exactly what you said, was the insistence that to be a biologist, in my case, and adhere to the scientific mainstream on evolution, uh, you had to renounce your faith. Um, you certainly had to be an atheist, and you might even have to be a Satanist. And I was furious at that. Um, you know, I always tell people I got a lot of problems with the Catholic Church, but evolution isn't one of them. Um, and in fact, you know, get, get a grip on reality here. Um, go to Notre Dame University and look at their curriculum. Go to the College of the Holy Cross. Go to Loyola University. Go to Georgetown. Go to the great Catholic universities in this country. Do you think evolution is not taught in their biology departments? Of course it is. So, you know, once again, you know, the notion that evolution cannot be accommodated within a religious point of view, I think does two things. One is it pauperizes um, the theology that has been developed in the last couple hundred years to reconcile not just the Christian faith, but Abrahamic faiths in general with the advances of science. That's the first thing. Um, and the second thing is, I think it's actually dangerous to Christianity itself because what happens, and I get emails from college students about this all the time, that they were raised in a strict Christian fundamentalist uh, uh, home or environment that denies evolution. Then they go to college and they see how strong the evidence for evolution is, and then they abandon their faith. Um, and, you know, as a religious person, I think that's that means that science denial is dangerous to religion itself. Well, and that's I, one of the reasons I think it's foolish. I, I agree with that completely. As an atheist activist myself, it's so much easier for me to deconvert a hardcore creationist than, oh, yeah. than it would be for somebody who accepts at least mainstream science. Because then you did a whole different, you have to have much higher elevated arguments in those yeah. cases. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the first book, Iron, that I wrote um, for general audiences, not a textbook, but the first book I wrote for general audiences, as I'm sure you know, has a title called Finding Darwin's God. And the subtitle is A Scientist Search for Common Ground Between God and Evolution. And I can't tell you, the book is still in print, um, and it continues to do very well. Um, uh, I can't tell you how many emails and letters I've gotten from people who say, in essence, thank you very much for writing this book and making me appreciate that I don't have to be stupid to be a Christian. Um, and, you know, I've, every, every person I've convinced of that, I'm very happy about. Well, that brings me to the next question. I, sure. When we're talking about creationism, the thing that I find mystifying is how they... I, I wrote a book on foundational falsehoods, and, and the reason I call them foundational falsehoods is because these are the things you, that a hardcore creationist cannot admit. They, they cannot, as Behe himself did... He refused to, he said that there cannot be an explanation for the immune system. And then he's shown like what are the 47 books. Yeah. And in the opinion of the judge, he said that they're all not good enough. Now, clearly they were good enough a while back. You know, they would be good enough for any other person. Well, you say that it can't exist and there it is 47 times. Other people would recognize that. Sure. When, when each of the testable claims were made about intelligence, about irreducible complexity and every one of them is disproved. I have to explain to these people that, yes, it was disproved. No, it wasn't. Here's the ruling of the judge. Well, that's just a judge. That's not science. Yeah, but it was already done in science. It was already disproved in science. They just publicized it in the courtroom. You'll never get an admission. I will argue with people that, that say there's no transitional species, go through the definition of transitional species, provide the list of hundreds of transitional species. And then in, in one case, the guy was very specific about why he would refu he refused. He said, I see your point, but admitting that it, that a, that a, species exist that fits the definition that I myself provided would mean admitting that evolution is possible. And he couldn't even admit that. 
they can't even think hypothetically. So the question I'm leading up to is, can you explain the mindset of people who are so dogmatic that they will, and on some cases they will admit that they, that they, they know that what they're, what they're saying is not true, but that they have to support it anyway. They know exactly what lie they need to tell at what cue, and they can never, ever admit when they're wrong. Can well, you in that mindset? I, 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 I started off, if I remember, it's, a little, it's 20 years since I wrote that book that I just referred to. And if I remember correctly, I started off by saying, putting in quotes, hi, where, where are you from? And, you know, being on a college campus, and of course we have new students every year, we have orientation, and we have to get to know exercises. So that question, where are you from, is very often two strangers' ways of getting to know each other. And where are you from matters. And I'm not talking about geography. I'm talking about, you know, how do you see your own life, its meaning, its importance, what is the source of your life? What is the source of life in general? And, you know, for, for many of us, trying to, uh, for many of us, the central mystery of existence is trying to understand the significance or perhaps the lack of significance in human existence. And that's not just the Christian thing. Uh, you know, read Plato. Uh, read, read Aristotle. You know, the issue of, you know, what, what is man that thou art mindful of? And that's a serious question. And for people who have been raised in an environment in which they've been told, and they believe for very good reasons, that we've got it all figured out. Here is your exact place in nature. Um, the, uh, the first couple of questions in the Baltimore Catechism, which is the old fashioned question and answer catechism that I was taught as a young kid growing up is, who made us answer God made us. Next question. Why did God make us? Answer. God made us to know, love, and serve him. Well, you know, th 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 that's how Catholic kids were brought up for, literally for decades. Um, and there's a certain warm assurance to think that you are a creature with a definite purpose in the world. And if you've been brought up that way and you are taught that the Bible is to be read literally, to discover that we are creatures of evolution, that we have a biological kinship on this planet, literally with every other living thing, that is profoundly disturbing. Um, and, and I've seen how difficult this is for people sort of, sort of to get their intellectual grasp on. Um, and I think it's largely because you are undermining someone's self-image. Deep down inside, they're thinking, my goodness, my entire view of the world, more importantly, my entire view of myself has been a lie. And therefore, it becomes much easier to say, no, 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 I'm not doing that, um, than, to actually, uh, than to actually come to grips with the scientific evidence. Um, the, uh, I, I don't know if you know this particular piece of scientific evidence, but it's one that I have always found persuasive in front of audiences and so many people when I bring this up, they'll come up to me and say, oh, my God, I don't know how to deal with that. Um, we human, human beings have 46 chromosomes. Um, we are one of the great apes. That's not controversial. That We've been classified that way since Linnaeus, 150 years before Darwin. But all the other great apes have 48 chromosomes. So a baby chimp gets 24 chromosomes from mom and 24 from dad. You and I got 23 from each of our parents. Now, if we're closely related to these guys, not just chimps, gorillas, orangs, bonobos, all have 48. If we're so closely related to these guys, why are we missing a pair of chromosomes? Is it possible that in the human lineage, a pair of chromosomes just got lost? The answer is no. There are too many important genes on every homologous pair of chromosomes. So if you lost a pair, you wouldn't even be able to get through embryonic development. So there's only one answer that is consistent with evolutionary common ancestry between us and the other great apes. And that is two chromosomes that are still separate in the other great apes at one point in our evolutionary history must have been accidentally fused together to form a single chromosome in us. 
And if that happened, it would drop us from 24 pairs down to 23. But this is why this is science and not conjecture. If that actually happened, there should be evidence of a fusion, a, a, a place where two chromosomes are stuck together somewhere in our genome. And if that evidence is not there, then the whole idea of common ancestry is on shaky ground. Well, after the Human Genome Project gave us a complete look at the genome, guess what? We have such a chromosome. It's human chromosome number two. And you can actually see in the DNA sequence, and I've published about this in my most recent book, the exact place where these two chromosomes came together. And we can also see that the two halves of our chromosome number two correspond to what used to be um, primate chromosome 12 and primate chromosome 13. And in fact, the similarity is so great that in the genomes of those other uh, great apes, they don't call those chromosomes 12 and 13 anymore. They call them 2A and 2B because they correspond to the two halves of the human chromosome. There is literally, you know, DNA sequences are facts. They're not hypothesis. They're not conjecture. They're not theory. They're facts. And there is literally no way to explain that uh, without uh, realizing that we share a common ancestor with these with these individuals. When I've spoken to lay audiences about this or religious audiences, a very large number of people are absolutely shocked because they've never heard it before. I always tell them that's my fault and the fault of everybody else in science because we don't popularize our own discoveries as effectively as we should. But they're also shocked because of what it does to their own self-image. It turns the world literally upside down. And I think I can understand why that's upsetting to people. I have a very different perspective because I was never a creationist. I mean, there was a time for a long, you know, throughout my, the entirety of my youth into adulthood, I believed in God. But I was never a creationist. The, you know, when, when, when people brought me, you know, the Bible, unfortunately, I was, I was raised in a family that thought that you don't indoctrinate a child until they're eight years old. And by the time I was eight years old, I was in second grade. I'd already seen pictures of, you know, I'd already seen books on dinosaurs and seen cladograms and that sort of yeah. thing, or dendrograms anyway. But but I always looked at the way the Bible says, let the earth bring forth all of these animals and plants after their own kind. That's how monophyletic phylogenetic evolution, it, it's the best way to explain that. It's exactly, yeah, that's a perfect. That's a perfectly good way to read Genesis chapter one. And so I don't understand when the, when, the, when the creationists then try to turn it around and says, well, you know, an argument against evolution is you never have something that 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 one thing give birth to another fundamentally different thing. Well, you're right. Never in evolutionary history does that happen. So let's talk about what evolution actually is. And I can I can never get them on board with that. They they have they they realize they have to misrepresent it. And that brings me to another point. Um, we've had you on for an hour and the original plan was to let you talk for, for 30 minutes about your own experience, which I very much enjoyed. That's why we're now at an hour. Um, but we were supposed to do the second half hour with questions uh, wow. from our audience. Are, do you have time? And yeah, I, I, can, I can hang on a little longer. I have a, like you, I have a dog right next to me. Uh, he's very patient. He'd like to go out for a walk, but I think he can hold it for 30 more minutes. All right, uh, uh, Lalandra, do you do you have a list of questions from the, the super chats and so forth? Yes. Um, I uh, first, I'd like to comment on my own, and I don't mean to take up too much time. I, I've taught uh, science in the sixth to eighth grade level, and one time I had so, uh, some an after school program where the uh, it was frankly a minister from a church uh, telling the young children that. Uh, repeat after me god said let there be a dinosaur and just like that so i'm a teacher there also and my child was one of the children too so i go to the, the principal and she says she says uh i told her that it was interfering with the texas science standards to say that that um things were created so rapidly because it's part of the texas science standards uh old earth and everything like that and geology and, and such and this is the problem with intelligent design it appeals to people's sense of fairness like 
uh, and she's like, well, well, you have your opinion and he has his. So like, it's really, I mean, as someone who has written, written textbooks before, uh, high, high school science textbooks, like, how can we get across to people who don't understand the nature of science? Because the people who came up with intelligent design, they were looking, they were saying things like irreducible complexity because you, they know in order to get into a science textbook it has to be testable, have some kind of testable prediction. And, um, but people can't differentiate between this uh, kind of flim flam and uh, what science is and what it does. I mean, what could you write about irreducible complexity in a science textbook? Like you wouldn't be, there would, there's no discovery there. All you're saying is, I don't know how this happened. Uh, it must be okay, this. Well, well let, let, me, let, let, let me jump right in and try to answer that directly. First thing is, um, I don't just write textbooks. I have testified in front of the Texas State Board of Education three times during the textbook adoption process in Texas. How did and we miss it, you? Pardon me? <laughs> My wife and I have also testified before the Texas there was, I, I think it was, um, try to remember, uh, it was probably the adoption in 86 or 87. It, it was. It was, the, it was the year before I started doing it. Yeah, okay. So, uh, and, and at the here it was a very interesting public hearing. I got to meet Mel and Norma Gabler, uh, which was really quite a trip. Um, although I would tell your other viewers who they were, it's too much history here. Um, but at one point, a member of the board actually held up a, a copy of my textbook and misrepresented what I had written about human embryology. And um, when they when they criticize a publisher's entry, um, they uh, the publishers usually the publisher's rep usually gets up at the board of education meeting uh, and says, uh, "Thank you for the input." we will exercise our right to respond uh, within 10 days in writing. So I was sitting there fuming as this guy misrepresented my book. And I was sitting next to the, uh, the sort of the, the chief of marketing for Texas for my publisher. And he could see I was getting hot under the collar. So this guy finished his comments and then he elbowed me in a good Texas accent and said, hey, you want a shot at this boy? Uh, and I said, yes, I do. <laughs> and he got up and said, well, we're going to respond in writing, but I have the author here and he's going to answer that. And this guy, the board member's head turned so fast when he said the word author, I thought he was going to hurt his neck. Uh, and I got up and basically went through it and I gave him a, 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 a quick lesson on what a pharyngeal arch is, how it's related to gill slits in some organisms how it's not related to gill slits in us and how it forms the hyaline cartilage in the lower jaw and a few other sorts of things. Well, at the end of that day, when the hearings adjourned, I have to tell you this, I couldn't buy myself a beer in Austin anywhere because the Texas Education Authority, the professional people, the other publishers, reps, the other authors who were there, they were all thrilled to see the dressing down and I don't know if it was the Chronicle or the Austin American Statesman who had a little headline on the second section of the paper saying board member gets biology lesson. Mm -hmm. So um, I, um, I know the Texas process. I know the Texas board and I know the Texas standards. They're called the TEKS, the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. And the TEKS at the present time are actually pretty good. Could be better but they're pretty good with respect to uh, evolution, geological ages, and that sort of stuff. So this business of, well, isn't my opinion just as good as yours? Um, you gotta remember something, and that is on all sorts of questions, there can be more than two opinions. So it's not a question of saying what both sides think, because there's often multiple sides. I, um, If you'd like to teach, the biblical creation story, well, that's fine, but please don't forget the Navajo one, which is really quite interesting. And please don't forget the Hindu one. Um, and there are versions everywhere. Um, so the real question is, if this is a science book and a science course, what is the scientific consensus on this issue? Is that consensus supported by experimental and observational evidence? And can we explain to students what the nature of that support is. 
And I think that's what good science education is about. Honey, can you start into the with the questions? Yes, I can. And like that's exactly what I was talking about. And they've actually here in Texas talk about teaching both sides. But you're saying there's multiple sides, the Navajo story and such. But you still could oh, put origin stories in the science classroom because they're not science uh, history, perhaps. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, during the Kitzmiller trial, it's important to realize this play took place in 2005. Um, and in terms of the idea of divine intervention, I actually said in court, I said, Your Honor, I'm sure you're aware that this this past year, the Boston Red Sox won the World Series, even though they were down three games to none against the New York Yankees. And a lot of people in my part of the country think that has to be the result of divine intervention, meaning that God was just tired of George Steinbrenner and wanted to teach him a lesson. And you'd be surprised how many people in the Boston area think that's probably a pretty good explanation. But it's not testable. It's not scientific. And I'm not going to talk about that in the science classroom. The judge liked it. Yeah, and, I, and more people need to understand that and yeah. uh, be able to uh, separate fact from opinion as well. Sure. Um, so you have some questions. Yes. Uh, the first one is someone who donated a uh, cat carat. Dr. Miller, would you debate Kent Hovind? Um, inadvertently, I debated him once, which was I was on a book tour about 20 years ago and I believe I was in Kansas City and I was on a radio program. And I had about an hour stint on a call and talk radio program. And the host ambushed me by saying, uh, we're not going to make call-ins today. Instead, uh, we're going to have you debate Kent Hovind. Uh, and it was just like, oh, OK. So this is before the felony convictions. This is before the prison time, uh, all this other sort of stuff. And all he kept doing was plugging his website, drdino.com. Uh, and he'd go on and on and on. Um, when I, uh, I mentioned the fact that I did debate Henry Morris, sort of the grand old man of creationism, um, and, and did so, I think, quite successfully, even by Dr. Morris's admission. Um, and I, I debated, oh, about five more times in the next couple of years. I thought it was important at the time for science not to concede the public square to the creationists, but to answer their arguments point by point. At this point, I think those arguments have been answered. And I really have no desire to stand up next to Kent Hovind as if there are two equally represented sides in this issue. Um, the opinion, if you want to call it that, in the scientific community would be 99 to 1, um, maybe higher than that. So it's foolish to say, well, here's this point of view, here's that point of view, make your decision. That's not how science works. So no, I'm not interested in devoting in debating Kent Hovind. There would be way too many lies and misrepresentations to deal with in a short period of time. They call that the Gish Gallup, uh, another- Yeah, but, but, but do you know the Dwayne Gish, who, who I debated twice? Oh, wow. Dwayne, Dwayne Gish once accused me of doing the Miller Gallup that I was presenting too many <laughs> slides and too many thoughts, and he yeah, didn't have yeah. time to answer them. Kid Hovind tried to accuse me of doing the raw rush. <laughs> the raw rush. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. I was so hopeful in 2005 when when Kitzmiller versus Dover was won and Ho and Hovind was in prison. That was that just seemed like it was we were gonna we were gonna make progress at last. Yeah, God's <laughs> in heaven and all's right with the world. Yeah. Um, th there's another super chat, and it's not really a question, but thank you, Nani Casio. And they, of course, they uh, uh, they are saying uh, that hopefully Trump gets 20 years for each crime. <laughs> it, it, okay, here, next. Uh, I think that's a little a little outside of the scope of the discussion. Yeah. Um, I only brought it up because they donated. Uh, here we go. Um, Dr. Miller, know of how many other school boards? felt the fallout of Kitz Miller, Dover, and had to change their curriculum? The, the truth is there weren't many who had to change the curriculum because there were no other boards of education um, that, that were really implementing intelligent design as a policy. The Discovery Institute, in fact, was delighted 
to have at first to have the cooperation of the Dover Area School Board because they thought this would be the first one. This would be their test case. It would pass constitutional muster and they would then be able to implement this in other school districts around the country. So um, no, there were no other school boards who were officially admitting uh, an intelligent design curriculum. Now I must say that surveys have shown that a significant fraction of biology teachers in this country are in fact creationists and do in fact say that they sort of give creationism or design as an alternative theory. But if they do so, they do so on their own, not with a, a curriculum endorsed by any state or to my knowledge, any school district either. There might be, uh, that might be allowable like as a supplement, you could, uh, teachers in Texas at least are allowed to bring in supplementary materials. So those could be uh, uh, the, these uh, creationist uh, propaganda also. But uh, here's the next question. Uh, how do you keep your faith separate from science? And can you impart that wisdom to some of the young earth creationist crowd? Question from Iron Charioteer. <laughs> Well, young earth creationism is a whole nother matter, and I'm, I'm not sure how redeemable um, uh, many young earth creationists are. But in terms of keeping faith separate, I, I have to tell you something that might surprise you or your, your audience. I don't feel that I keep my faith separate. Um, and, and here's what I mean. Um, what, one of my friends, I, I'm privileged to call him a friend. Um, is Brother Guy Consolmagno. He's a Jesuit brother. Um, he's a cosmologist, and he is the director of the Vatican Observatory. Now, for those of you who don't know it, the Vatican, for a couple hundred years, has maintained a very serious scientific effort in astronomy. They have telescopes literally all over the world. And uh, Guy um, is a Jesuit brother, not a priest, but a brother. Uh, and he has a PhD in astrophysics. Uh, so he's a very serious scientist. And because he's ob he wears a collar, so he's obviously recognizable as a person of faith. And people ask him all the time, what do you see in science that confirms your faith in God? As if you're looking through your telescope up there and, aha, there's the hand of God or something like that. And the way that he answers that is something I rather like. And he says, what I tell people is that I don't believe in God because of something I've seen in science. Rather, it's my faith in God that makes me believe in science. In other words, within his theological worldview is the idea that the universe in which we live is rational and is open to rational interpretation because it is the work of a rational creator. That's the reason the universe is interpretable. So for him, it's faith in God that justifies science. And, you know, I, I would be tempted to say pretty much the same thing. And what I mean by that is I do not use my faith to get scientific answers or to decide what I have to discover or what I should see in my electron microscope or where the bands should be in my gel. But from my point of view, as a religious person, my faith in basically uh, uh, the meaning of the universe, justify science as a point of inquiry. Uh, it tells me that there's a reason why the universe is open to rational investigation. It tells me that knowledge is better than ignorance. And it tells me that our duty and purpose in this existence is to use our wits to figure out the world around us. So um, that's why I resist the saying that I keep my religious faith and my science separate because, you know, they're all part of the same person in me. But the idea that religion makes specific scientific claims that the scientist has to adhere to, that's a kind, that's a kind of belief that I completely reject. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, another question uh, from David Neff. Uh, would you accept any form of abiogenesis? And I'm not sure what direction they're coming at that from, because there's Miller Urey in the textbooks. Sure, uh, sure. Well, the, uh, the 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 Stanley Miller's great experiment, no relation, by the way, 
um, was basically to show that conditions that he thought prevailed on the primitive earth could produce um, the basic building blocks of life in terms of amino acids uh, and, and maybe simple nucleotides. Now, Stanley Miller repeated these experiments many times as our understanding of primitive earth atmospheres got better and better. Um, every time in almost every one of his experiments, you produced significant biological molecules, in some cases, uh, nitrogenous bases and simple amino acids and so forth. Um, those laboratory experiments are great. But for me, some of the best evidence for abiogenesis, for the, the sort of uh, the origin of life, uh, doesn't come from laboratory experiments. It comes from NASA. Uh, and the reason for that is our investigations, NASA's investigations, of the material in comets and meteorites shows that they have abundant organic compounds of the sort that would be required to build eventually a living organism. So we can say with some certainty that the nature of matter and energy and conditions within our solar system are amenable to the spontaneous assembly of the primitive, of the building box blocks of primitive life. So um, I think, and the way I would put it is like this, life obeys the laws of physics and chemistry. There is nothing that happens inside the living cell or inside a living organism that ultimately is not explicable scientifically in terms of the physics and chemistry of matter and energy. So if the laws of physics and chemistry are sufficient to sustain life, why would we not also think that the laws of physics and chemistry were sufficient to generate life in the first place? So I think the capability for life is literally built into the physics and chemistry of matter and energy. That, that anybody like questions any gaps in knowledge we have, that that's, a, that's proof of intelligent design, like the bacterial flagellum. So uh, like it's not really giving us any information that we can understand the universe better with, in my opinion. Yeah, let, 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 me, let, me, let me give you another quote from the, uh, the Kitzmiller trial, something I wish I had said. But it was said at the end of the trial by Kevin Padian, uh, a paleontologist at Berkeley. Um, and the, our attorney asked uh, Kevin, why, do you, why would you object to your son or daughter being taught about intelligent design in schools? Um, Kevin didn't expect the question, but he's good on a, on a retort. And he thought for a second, he said, I'm against intelligent design because it teaches kids to be stupid. And what he meant by that is basically the whole argument for intelligent design is to point to something that's complex in a living organism and say, ooh, look how complex it is. We can't imagine how evolution could have produced it. Therefore, we're done. So it teaches kids not to be inquisitive, not to investigate, and not to inquire. And that's what Kevin meant when he said intelligent design would teach kids to be stupid. We don't want to teach kids to be stupid. We want them to be curious and interested in inquiring about the world around them. Um, okay. The next question is, um, what- That was a brilliant answer, by the way, but you knew that. <laughs> um, I hope it's just the right answer. That's, a, that's what I'd settle for. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, by nature, science is, uh, is about in, inquisition, er, experimentation, you know, being inquired. Inquisition? I didn't expect that. <laughs> Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. You, you never expect the Inquisition. That's why it yeah. works. Yeah. Um, here's the question um, from Andrew Com Coming. Um, what are the fundamental assumptions of science? How do those assumptions differentiate science from intelligent design and supernatural explanations? Um, well, I, I would think that the, it, it, science is actually very hard to define. Uh, the word science comes from the Latin scientius, which simply means knowledge. That's why you have library science and political science and so forth. Uh, but natural science, physics, chemistry, biology, and so forth, um, I think makes a couple of functional, a, a couple of working assumptions. Um, the first one is that we human beings are capable of understanding the world 
and of inquiring as to how things work. And that we're able to do that by observation, by experiment, and by rational analysis. So the assumptions here are, first of all, that we can perceive reality, that there actually is an objective reality. Now, there are some people, there are some philosophers who think the notion of a, an objective reality is itself a falsehood. Um, I have no patience with those people. I think there is a real, genuine world out there uh, that science is capable of interrogating it, of investigating it. And I also think that for all its defects, human reason is capable of grappling with the complexities of nature. So that's an assumption as well. One of the things about science is science itself cannot prove that it is the only way to answer these fundamental questions. So science itself does rest, and I love to say this, I, science rests on two articles of faith. And they're articles of faith that I think all scientists share, even if they are themselves atheists. And the first thing is that the universe is interpretable. That's assumption number one. And assumption number two is that knowledge is better than ignorance. It's better to know what's out there than to be ignorant of it. And those are, to me, the two foundational faiths of the scientific inquiry. Isn't scientific there inquiry. also an, uh, an assumption that the universe of uniformitarianism, that uh, what uh, you observe about geology now is uniform most likely for the way it was what, what, what uniformitarianism what uniformitarianism assumes that the laws of physics haven't changed yes exactly uh, many people misstate uniformitarianism to say that the world has always been a nice sunny spring day and there have never been any catastrophes and so forth the the one assumption that is uh, that is properly put under the word uniformitarianism is that the laws of physics and chemistry have operated in the past as they operate in the present. And therefore, we can use processes that we see operating in the world around us today to explain what happened in the past. We can even extrapolate from what we see here to what might be happening on the moon or Mars. Yeah. Oh, ab absolutely. I mean, yeah. it, just, to, just to take a very simple example, the element helium, was discovered on the sun before it was known to exist on the earth. And the reason it was discovered on the sun is because there is a missing spectral band in uh, light coming from the sun that implied the existence of an element unknown on earth absor absorbing at that point. And it was called helium, helium after the, the sun god Helios. Um, so the assumption that was made was that the, the, the visible spectrum, and we understand how it's produced by certain gases raised to high temperatures, the principles that we have discovered on the Earth would apply on the sun as well. Uh, lo and behold, that was the reason for the identification of this unknown gas in the atmosphere of the sun, and about a decade passed before the helium was in fact discovered on Earth. And that's a you know, very good example of the principle um, that uh, the, the laws of nature apply everywhere, even to places that we can't get to very easily. I mean, there might be something we don't understand, especially at the quantum level, but uh, what, what we've discovered- oh, oh, basically... let, 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 Of course there are things we don't understand. Yeah. If we understand everything, my life as a research scientist is over. Exactly. How, de how depressing it would be to yeah. think that we understood everything. Irish comedian Darren O'Brien said, of course, science doesn't know everything. If it did, it would stop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I'd, be, I'd be unemployed. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, what do you, uh, Toughen Up Fluffy is asking, uh, what do you think about epigenetics? I'm in favor of it. Um, you know, I I'm will sorry, allow I it to help. exist. <laughs> I, 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 I can't help it. I grew up in New Jersey, so by definition, I'm a smart ass. Um, um, <laughs> epigenetics is a term that is applied to chemical modifications of the genetic material, of DNA, and of the proteins associated with DNA that influence the expression of genes. Um, epigenetic changes in our own genome affect the way in which different genes are expressed 
They don't change the DNA base sequence itself. And one of the really interesting discoveries of the last 15 years is that there are environmental influences that can actually affect the epigenetic tags that are attached to certain parts of our genome in certain chromosomes. Uh, and these epigenetic tags can not only affect the expression of genes, let's say, in me, but they can, under certain circumstances, be passed along to uh, my progeny through my own DNA so that epigenetic effects can last over several generations. Now, we're just beginning to learn exactly how these things work. Uh, epigenetics is a really uh, important and expanding field of cell and molecular biology, um, and we're finding out some fascinating stuff. So that's why I'm in favor of it. Thank you. Okay, uh, someone, uh, thank you, Death Row Boat, uh, for the donation. Uh, there, uh, He says, uh, or she, <laughs> I work for a public school system in Texas in a non-teaching role. It's sad to see the state of education here, especially how it's falling apart during the pandemic, which is largely due to public misunderstanding and distrust of science. Do you have a comment on that, how, how uh, uh, people aren't trusting the science to wear a mask and such? Yeah, this is, I mean, this is a difficult one. I, I, um, I, I am uh, uh, frankly appalled, not just as a scientist, but as a citizen, that in the current environment, basic, simple, sensible public health measures have become politicized. Um, the, 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 the least political person in public health whom I know is Anthony Fauci. Uh, I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Fauci once. Um, I've, uh, I am actually quite good friends with Francis Collins, who's the director of the National Institutes of Health. Both of these guys are great scientists and dedicated public servants without a political bone in their bodies. And it is appalling that, again, simple, sensible public health measures like keeping your distance, like wearing a mask, like getting tested, like contact tracing, they have become politicized. And, you know, I'm sorry, I wanted to talk about science, but in, in the context here, what we have is a national administration that basically has politicized public health science. And, and that's appalling and it's, uh, it's, it's unforgivable. And I hope we can get past that. And I hope we can get to the point where once again, uh, people accept scientific advice for what it is. And they also, they would put out information before the scientists came to a consensus. So we should trust uh, scientists and you should definitely trust a consensus of experts in a field. And uh, we're just not uh, getting there uh, in communicating the science about the pandemic. Very well, I, 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 you know, I honestly think the scientific community um, uh, uh, could use lessons in communication that we could do a much better job of explaining ourselves to the general public. Um, I'm tempted to say, um, you know, where is uh, Mr. Wizard now that we yeah. need him for presenting mm -hmm. with people of a certain age? Where is our Carl Sagan? Um, mm -hmm. Neil deGrasse Tyson comes pretty close, but because of the fragmented nature of communications, he doesn't have the audience that Carl Sagan did. Um, and, you know, I think we need more effective spokespeople for science. I think Anthony Fauci has been incredibly effective, uh, despite the opposition of many people in the current political administration. No, yeah, I, I'd he's love, more trusted uh, in polls yeah, than, than... But I, I'd, love to see doctor, I'd love to see Dr. Fauci have the opportunity to work under administration that trusted him and trusted mm -hmm. his scientific advice. Exactly. He's worked under several uh, administrations, Republican and Democrat. And Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, he, 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 he is the person who spearheaded um, the work on HIV and AIDS way back in the Reagan administration. And mm -hmm. he did it, as I say, he's completely non-political. He's straight down the middle of the road, even to the point where back in those days he was criticized by uh, gay activists as being anti-gay, which is nonsense in the case of Tony Fauci, um, simply because he insisted on scientific rigor in the investigation of HIV. Yeah. Okay, next question. Um, let's see. Um, how do you think 
the Genesis story, uh, how do you square the Genesis story with what science tells us about abiogenesis? The answer is I don't. Okay. The answer is mm -hmm. I don't. Um, you know, it, 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 Genesis was written in pre-scientific age. And I, I'm not a Bible scholar, but the Bible scholars I know suggest that the book of Genesis was written during the Babylonian captivity and that the purpose of the Genesis narrative was to distinguish the Hebrew conception of God from that of the good and evil spirits, which were the conception of their Babylonian captors. So what you have in a Genesis narrative, uh, to me, is not a scientific, it's not a historical story. It's an attempt to, to, to look at the relationship between creator and creation. Um, so I read it metaphorically, and I read it allegorically. And I have to tell you um, that in traditional Christianity, by which I mean medieval Christianity, for example, that's how Genesis is understood as well. Uh, no less an authority than St. Saint, than Saint Augustine, writing at the beginning of the 5th century, wrote a book called On the Literal Meaning of Genesis. And there are wonderful passages in that book. And one of the things that Augustine said, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, is if we read passages in Genesis, which are at odds with what we know through the observations of nature, today what we would call scientific inquiry, then it is up to us to reassess our understanding of Genesis. In other words, it's not up to us to distort science to make it conform to Genesis. It means that we're not reading Genesis properly. And if Augustine were alive today, I'm convinced he would be an evolutionist. Now, if 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 I if I if I may, uh, I'd like to request just to take one or two more questions and then call it a night. Okay, sure, uh, that's fine. Uh, just a quick thank you to Majestic Beck and also Darth Vaden for their donations. Uh, let me pick the. Well, the Dick, I had a question that I wanted to end with, but we'll uh, we'll weigh which question you answer. I'll throw out mine. She'll all throw out hers. Mine go ahead. is. Given the, the, the series of court cases that we've had up to this point, what do you predict will be the next case? I, I, I really don't anticipate um, a court case involving evolution anytime soon. I wonder um, if we're going to have litigation on the teaching of climate science uh, and some other matters driven in this case, not by religious fundamentalists, but driven by economic interests in terms of, you know, what do we tell kids about earth science, atmospheric science, and so forth. Um, the, the courtroom is a very poor way, a very poor place to decide scientific issues. Um, Judge Jones in the Kiss Miller trial has said that himself, and he's pointed out that he wasn't there to be an arbiter of science. He was there to answer the question as to whether or not intelligent design had any scientific standing or whether it was a religious doctrine in disguise. And the evidence showed very clearly that the effort to advance intelligent design was in fact religiously driven. And that's the reason that court case stayed that way. So, um, you know, I imagine uh, litigation basically driven by economic interest at this point rather than religious interest. I wonder, isn't that called the Levin test? whether something's really ah, okay so the, the 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 lemon test is a case and again the le lemon was one of the plaintiffs lemon versus uh, yeah there you go so the lemon test is a three-pronged test that can be used to determine if a government action violates the first amendment and i'm sure aaron is can name every one of those prongs i can probably only name one which is if the intent of a, the act is to either advance or to hinder religion it's unconstitutional. The second one is, I think, even if that's not the intent, if the effect of the act is to advance or hinder religion without a proper public purpose, it's unconstitutional. Yeah, it had third, to have a secular purpose. Right. And then it, and it and can't the, result in an, uh, an unnecessary entanglement. It's the, it's the, if I remember right, entanglement is the third part, third prong. And that's probably the most controversial one. Um, in terms of whether entanglement is sufficient to render an act unconstitutional. But that's the lemon test. Um, you know, the Supreme Court could decide at any time 
that the lemon test doesn't apply. But at the current time, it is precedent that lower courts are bound by. I almost wonder if people, uh, the Supreme Court will reinterpret that and the lemon test will no longer apply in the future. Given well, well, you, have that, remember, you have to remember, they just don't speak ex cathedra. They have to mm -hmm. wait for an appropriate case to get there. Yeah, there's Project, Project Blitz where they're uh, trying to, to challenge more cases and get them to the Supreme Court so sure, they can... Yeah, yep. but the, the last thing that uh, off the... It isn't really a question. It was just like to close and thank you. Uh, thank you, Sean H. in New Zealand. He, he said, even in far away New Zealand, I appreciate your videos like this. Your patience in having a non-hysterical guest makes worthwhile listening. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm, I'm very thanks. glad that I passed the test of being non-hysterical. <laughs> yeah. Very, well, very interesting and uh, factual. Yeah, and it has been my pleasure having you on. Uh, Kenneth Miller, everyone, thank you very, very much. Wait, 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 before you. you go, before you go, uh, your projects. You, did you say that you had a book? Sure, I got lots of books. You want me to hold them up? <laughs> <laughs> I only got one. <laughs> <laughs> well, he went to go get his books. <laughs> no, it's fine. Don't I, I'm worry, really... I'm going far. Okay. Uh, here we go. Okay, so besides textbooks, which of course are still out there, uh, mm -hmm. this is my most recent book. It's called The Human Instinct, How Evolution Gave Us Reason, Consciousness, and Free Will. Okay. Simon and Schuster. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this opportunity. <laughs> oh, thank you. The pleasure is ours. Okay. Have All a good right. evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Bye bye. Yes.